Welcome to Semantic Web Technologies. This is lecture number six, Applications in the Web of Data. And now we want to continue exploring linked data engineering. So, in the last part of the lecture, we have learned about the linked data or the linked open data cloud, which is a huge network of data sets that are published via the linked data principles and linked among each other. And you see here the big hub, the DBpedia in the center of this linked data cloud. And this one is a special version because here the different categories of the data sets that have been linked together, they are marked with a specific color. So you can distinguish these data sets. Okay, first take a look at the DBpedia, but I think you will already know that. The DBpedia, of course, is the central hub of the linked open data cloud. And of course, it stems or it comes from the Wikipedia. And in the Wikipedia, you know, there is for lots of articles on the right side, there is a so-called info box. And this info box is nothing else but a structured table. And in this table, there is structured data. And of course, this structured data simply can be read in an automated way and can be translated in an automated way into RDF. So, this here in the wiki syntax language of the Wikipedia is the content of the info box and there you see always these name and value pairs and these can be simply translated into RDF. And what comes out of this is the DBpedia, of course, you do not only take these tables, behind these tables and behind the classes, there must be, of course, ontology. So these, or each individual that represents an article in the, DB, in the Wikipedia has also been connected to a class in an ontology to represent knowledge about this class. And of course, then here, all the properties must be properties of the class that is, has to be represented. And then it makes sense. And then you can define an RDF or an OWL class for the class that is represented by that individual in the Wikipedia and you come up with the DBpedia data that you will find on the web. But we have already talked about the DBpedia. Okay, let's have a look again at the linked open data cloud. And here you see the categories made visible by the different colors. So for example, for the blue color here, stands media data or multimedia data. You will find here, for example, um, the BBC uh, database or BBC program data, BBC music data. You will find here music brains and so on and so on. And here, the orange part is the user generated content. Therefore, for example, you have here SlideShare or you also have here um, Yovisto, the um, uh, video search portal with more than 10,000 uh, educational videos. Maybe you already know that. Okay, let's continue around. Then here the green part, the green category here, are data about publications. So it's bibliographical data mostly. Then on the other side here, also in green, we have government data, which is a rather huge part of the available linked open data cloud, which is still or continuously growing. And the yellow part here are the so-called geographic data. So here, of course, is GeoNames database, the US Census data, and linked GeoData, GeoWordNet, and stuff like that. So this is geographically related data, this is, which is also rather important. And at last, we have the cross-domain data. So for example, the encyclopedias like the DBpedia is here and also the ontologies, Iago, Umbel, OpenPsych, and so on. And here, the um, red part, it's life sciences. Life sciences are almost, uh, please forgive me, so-called legacy data because in life sciences, they tried to uh, build up ontologies and knowledge representations uh, for a much longer time than we do here uh, in the semantic web. So they have been translated then, of course, from their original representation into RDF data. And this is also a rather huge part of the linked data cloud. Let's look at a few numbers. So here you see for the, 
specific groups or domains. You see here the number of triples that are represented here and the number of data sets. So for example, we have 25 media data sets with almost 2 billion triples. And you can see here that the most triples are here in the government data set. So in the government data set, we have 42%. So it's here the green part of all the triples in the DBpedia. On the other hand, for example, life sciences is rather small. It's also big, small, it's 41 data sets with 3 billion data. So this is only 10, roughly 10%. But it's different if you look at the interlinking of this data. The interlinking is completely different. So for example, if you look here at the government data, which was more than 40% of all the triples, you see that it only contains 4% of all the links. So here government data, if it comes to the links, it's badly connected. It's only 4% of it, it's really connected. So here, the life sciences, you see here, they are much better connected life sciences here with 10% of the triples, but almost 40% of the links. So here it's vice versa. And you see, especially here, if you compare the numbers, we have 31 billion triples, but only 500 million links, of course the data could be better connected and therefore it's rather valuable and important when you include new data also to establish links to already existing data because only then you can make use of it. Okay, but what is it what really holds this big linked data cloud together? It's the ontologies that link the data in general. And here you see some of the ontologies that are the basis of the linked data cloud. One of them is rather important, Umbel, for example, uh, or, or also a smaller one, Yago, it's called, uh, WordNet, Forth, and other things. We will talk about some of these um, ontologies. So first of all, of course, OWL and the two concepts like OWL same as and OWL equivalent class are rather important to link between entities, with OWL same as you link one entity to another entity, and classes classes you link with OWL equivalent uh, class. But of course with OWL you only have the possibility to say something is the same or something is different. In between to say something is closely or almost the same. This is difficult. You can't do that with OWL, therefore we need another vocabulary, but we will come to that later. One of the large ontologies or upper level ontologies we use is the UMBL ontology. And UMBL stands for Upper Mapping and Binding Exchange Layer. And this is a subset of the huge Open Psych ontology. And this, of course, is represented as RDF triples that are based on SCOS. We will come to SCOS later. And OWL2. Overall, there are 28,000 concepts or classes represented in UMBL. And there are 46,000 mappings into DBpedia, GeoNames, and other data sets with OWL equivalent class or RDFS subclass of. And again, there are also links to more than 2 million Wikipedia pages. So this is one of the center, central hubs within um, the linked open data cloud. Um, to connect vocabularies and data sets, there SCOS is the most important vocabulary. So SCOS is simple knowledge organization system it's also based on RDF and RDFS. And what you do with SCOS is you try to relate two different ontologies with one another, or two vocabularies with one another. With SCOS, you can define what a concept is. So this is similar to, to an OWL class or an RDF class. And with a definition, you can say something is more general than you use SCOS broader, or something is more special than another thing than you use SCOS narrower. And if you want to say that two things somehow are related, then you have also the term SCOS related. So you see this is much more expressive than simply OWL, where you only can say something is the same or something is different. And then you have also for the equality, the possibility to say, okay, this is an exact match. So this is quite the same as OWL same as, even it's more exact, it's really an exact match. Then there is something like a narrow match, close match. There is something like a broad match. And there is something like a related match. And of course, these things are explained in an informal way 
um, via natural language, but they can be used then to relate um, entities and classes within vocabularies with each other. So this is rather important. Okay, so these are the most important building blocks of linked data. So, how do I find linked data sources on the web? Or how do I publish linked data on the web? The first thing you can do is, of course, you can natively publish linked data with, uh, for example, a Sparkle endpoint that you establish or a so-called D2R server. This is a wrapper for a, for a database where uh, you can put on a Sparkle endpoint on a database, for example, so on D2R server. And the other thing is you can implement several wrappers around existing applications. So, for example, there is a shock wrap exporter for WordPress, Drupal, or other um, uh, content management systems, or there is an RDF book mesh up for the Amazon API, for the Google Base API, and stuff like that. So there are wrappers that translate common structured data or APIs into the semantic web world, into the linked data world. And of course, you can look up uh, information at the linked open data project. And you find their information at the Semantic Web Education Working Group and also at the Outreach W3C Working Group. The links will be given and the references will be given in the reading material. And there will, you will find a catalog of all known sources of linked data that have an open source license. So you will find DBpedia, Flickr, OpenPsych, FOF, Shock, GeoNames and more like this. Then to browse linked data on the web, there are, there are special browsers, for example. The, uh, and they are able to extract the RDF data or RDF8 data from web pages and then to show them to you in a special way. So the, I, I think the oldest one is the tabulator browser that stems from, or that comes from Tim Berners-Lee himself. So he developed one of the first uh, RDF browsers that you can use on the web and then you can see the data within the web page when there is RDFA data, for example. And um, there are several other browsers with links that you can try out and there are also so-called browser extensions for Firefox or for Chrome that you can use to extract RDF data that is somewhere in the HTML web page or if you access an RDF data set, it will be structured and browsed in a way that you can read it with these browsers. What else is there with tools? There are special search engines. Of course, there are search engines that are specialized on linked data. Um, the oldest one is Swoogle. This is a keyword-based full text search engine based on Apache Lucene that uses only limited semantic annotation. Then is SWSE, so the semantic web search engine. This comes from the Derry Research Institute. And there is Syndij. Falcons and also Sigma. Sigma is the newest one. It's based on Syndici. And here are also the links. And you should try it out there. You can, can find much information and you can simply search for a word. And then it looks up, are there resources in the linked data cloud that are related to your query? And then you can select certain data sets, certain ontologies, certain entities that you can use for your applications. So for this uh, kind of purpose. You can use these search engines that are specialized on linked data. Okay, but maybe you want to build your own linked data-driven web application. What do you have to consider? Of course, there is also a guide with best practices that we have linked. And usually you have to consider some local RDF store where you cache your results and that you use as a permanent storage for your application. Then, um, the logic and the user interface, so business logic and controller. This is, of course, not specific for linked data applications. You always have to consider this, and this, of course, make in the end the application. But what you need is some kind of a data integration component. And this, of course, can have access directly to the linked data cloud or to some kind of semantic indexer. It means to one of these uh, semantic web search engines, for example, that we have already seen. And in the end, you also, you, you, maybe you do not only want to use um, linked data, maybe you also want to publish new linked data. Then you have to consider a data republishing component to write back application-dependent data back into the web of data. 
But how you can do this, you can look it up in the best practices that we have linked in the reading material. Okay, usually you have to access Sparkle endpoints for your linked data driven application and the point is where do you find these endpoints. And there is of course a, web point, uh, a website at the W3C where you see the currently alive Sparkle endpoints. You can find it here. Or, and the nice thing is of course Sparkle endpoints are so called restful web services. It means you can access them via a simple HTTP GET request and we have already seen how we can formulate a Sparkle query with HTTP and send it then to the Sparkle endpoint. And the result will be given in different formats. So these formats, how you uh, want to have your, your, your result back, this can be guided or uh, uh, this is driven by the parameters that you use in your Sparkle query. And this can be XML, this can be JSON, this can be plain text, this can even be RDX XML, triples, turtle, so any kind of format. And this can be determined via here the uh, accept header again or if via parameters that you use. And the easiest way to uh, make an application, of course, is to use one of these linked data or semantic web libraries. You will see here there is a Sparkle JavaScript library that you can use. There is also for Sparkle the Arc library for PHP. Rep is also an RDF API for PHP. Then for Java, we have, for example, Jenna and Arc. We have uh, Sparkle endpoint uh, also based on, on Java at Sesame. And then we have, uh, even for Python, there is a Sparkle wrapper and there are more and more. So you can look them up in the web and then choose the programming language that you are used to apply. And then you can make use of Sparkle endpoints and of linked data applications within your own mashup that you try to program. As a simple example, to make a rather small program that uses um, here uh, linked data on the web, I have here an example with a Jenna RRQ. Um, what you see here, it's Java based, of course. Then here you import the library that you need, and then you define here simply the service that you want to access. This means this is the Sparkle endpoint that you want to access. And then you define the query. So this will be the query string, the select or construct that you use here in Sparkle. And then you instantiate a query execution E here that comes from a query execution factory and uses here the Sparkle service. The Sparkle service is defined by the service endpoint and the query you want to uh, give to the, to the endpoint. And then you define uh, results and you say here your Sparkle execution, you call a method, it's called exec select. And then you call the select statement you have uh, uh, stated here and um, then in results, the results will be stored according to how you uh, choose the parameters in your Sparkle query you have over here. And then you can simply iterate through the result list with a hex, uh, has next iterator and then you have single uh, query solutions here in S which are then uh, one line or one row of the result and then you can process it further. So this is really the simplest way to access linked data on the web with a small Java program and this is also with the other programming languages with Python or with PHP it's uh, alike. So it's, it's also rather simple to do that. You should try it out anyway. Okay, so much for linked data. Of course this is not an in-depth uh, professional programming course, what it's only part or one of the part of the semantic web technology course that we have here in six lectures. Um, we have three other topics or two other topics on the list that we still have to cope with uh, in the uh, applications in the web of data lecture. And the first is really important in the next part of the lecture, we will talk about named entity recognition. And this is the process how I find the right entity to connect with in my semantic network. So for example, if I have a text and I have only a name given in a text, then this name is only a character string. Of course, it's not an entity. And how with this name, 
which is ambiguous. How do I find the right entity in an automated way? This process is called named entity recognition or entity mapping, and we will cover this in the next part of the lecture.